So welcome. Uh, this is a um, live recording of a podcast that we run out of the International Spy Museum every week called SpyCast. Um, we decided to do this tonight because it's kind of a cool way of doing it. Every so often doing one in front of an audience is kind of fun because I ask a lot of questions. We have one every week, so I do 52 a year and I've got to come up with the questions. It's fun to actually let other people get involved. I mean, not fun for me, I like hearing myself talk, but it gives an opportunity for the other person to not have to listen to me the entire time and can get other people's <laughs> input on what's going on. So uh, and please, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to give as much time as I can at the end so you guys can ask your own questions of Emily because uh, we're gonna integrate that into the podcast as well. Uh, if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, never heard of SpyCast before, come check it out. Uh, it's on iTunes and Spotify and everywhere else you can get your podcast. I've talked to everyone from current and former directors of agencies down to individual case officers on the ground doing work overseas to really, really old guys who can tell you how the good old days in Berlin back in the 50s and 60s were, uh, to former terrorists and uh, former KGB officers and everybody in between. Um, and now you're talking to me. And now I'm talking to you. I don't understand. Well, no, no. I mean, this is <laughs> so what, what's really fun about tonight is. A lot of times I'll get an author or a journalist or a historian or a former spook or somebody that I've never met before. Like I literally met like 10 minutes before the podcast began. And so there's always this feeling out period of how goofy can I be? How humorous can the conversation be? Am I gonna get along with this person? So it helps when I've actually known the person I'm interviewing for quite some time. Uh, has anyone been through the actual museum, the, the, the galleries itself? You might actually recognize Emily if you've been to the Cyber Infinity Room where all the mirrors are, all right? Emily's one of the three people in that room talking about cyber and different aspects. And if you did the Hollywood versus reality cyber game, uh, you also might recognize her because we, we double time. We do, made her do both things for us. Uh, but let me actually introduce you formally instead of, of doing this. Her name is Emily Krauss. I'm just joking. It's Emily Krauss. We had a 20-minute <laughs> conversation about how our names get constantly butchered. Um, she is a cybersecurity researcher and practitioner focusing on defending critical infrastructure uh, against cyber attacks around the world. She's over a decade working in the national security, cybersecurity field, including seven years working for the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and INSCOM, which is the United States Army's um, Informa Intelligence Security Command. Uh, she's also an advocate for the inclusion of women, persons of color, and LGBT in discussions about personal privacy, security, and government transparency. And like I said, she was very, very nice to volunteer her time to help us build this new museum and to help us bring this topic, which is so misunderstood, to our visitors. I mean, to talk about somebody who knows this field better than anybody. Um, and so welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us thanks here at for, SpyCast. Thanks for having me. Of it's course. So let's start with you, wonderful. because I, I think that um, it, you have a really interesting background that you don't tend to see a lot of. You, you look like you're 19, but you're not. I won't, tell, oh, I won't say how old you actually are. But you've been doing this I for quite some time. I can't drive and drink. Drive so and drink and rent a car. Um, <laughs> so what, what got you into the field? Because uh, you, you broke bad at some point. You were doing yep. a great, you're going in a great direction. You were studying history in college. You're going to be a history teacher. And then you started selling meth. I mean, you went into cyber. Yep. I don't know what happened. You just went in a bad direction. <laughs> I, I really, what, what I really made you a, What really made you go turn. to the dark side? Uh, well, so the, the real answer there is less about meth and more about uh, how I realized it's, it's at a certain point that I really wanted to be a part of history and actually do something that helps move history in a direction rather than talk about history. I love history. It's my, one of my favorite topics, always has been. Um, so nothing, nothing, no. Uh, no, nothing against the historians. Um, now I participate in a different way. So. Um, uh, my my interest kind of pre-existed. I've always been involved in, um, it, to some degree, with security, and just uh, decided to to make that professional thing instead. Well, what made you decide to go government uh, versus doing hacktivism or working on your own? I mean, there's so many opportunities to be part of a conglomerate, whether it's something as far f out of field as anonymous, or yeah. you know, more of like white hat hackers or others. You went NSA, right? You yeah. you went the kind of government the man route. I did. Like what pushed you in that direction versus others? Because now you're the opposite to a degree. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think there was, there was definitely an interest to understand that world better. And it might have something to do with my interest in history because these agencies touch historic topics so much that it's, 
um, it, they, they drive so much of the topic that it's almost hard to avoid it. Um, uh, any part of history where, especially modern history, where intelligence isn't involved is actually kind of hard to find a, a component of modern society that hasn't been impacted. Well, tell us everything you did at CIA. Oh, I will definitely tell you every part. <laughs> um, so, so there's obviously a, a directive not to speak on uh, anything specific, but there, the U.S. government obviously has a, a stake in cybersecurity and def in defense and um, for national security reasons. Um, so there, there is a cybersecurity component to intelligence that is growing and, uh, and increasingly important in the modern age because everybody puts some information that's sensitive about them in some kind of computer system. Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to retrieve that information that's up to uh, governments and, and even private industries to uh, resource from those machines. And there's all kinds of ways to do that, but it's, um, it's definitely within the wheelhouse of governments to be involved in that as well. From when you started, how much did you see things change along the way? I know we've had now the creation of Cyber Command. Mm -hmm. We've had the creation of um, the, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, which is around the time that you got into the business. Um, and obviously, even if it was before or after, there's been so much transition, so much change yes. that's gone on and how these agencies work with each other. Yep. As I mentioned, you work for three different major big agencies mm -hmm. doing you know, cyber work. How, in the seven years you worked directly for the government, what kind of evolution did you see? through that time? Yeah, there's uh, so many evolutions. Um, even, even in the seven years that I was there, the, the amount of change that, that came about just um, from, from all aspects of understanding cyber, um, there, there's too much to get into any one specific thing. But if I had to choose one, it, it might be the understanding of uh, cyber, the, the concept of cyber warfare um, and disinformation, especially since 2016. That's been kind of a big thing. So um, there, there, there's been an evolution on the topic of how that impacts uh, social aspects maybe a bit more than uh, this, this general idea of, and I'm kind of switching gears, uh, hard gears here, but the way that, that war kind of evolves is it starts, you, you have to come from something that you understand. So people uh, hitting each other with sticks to hitting each other with swords to doing basically the same thing, but with guns in a field. Um, so the idea of cyber warfare comes from this evolution of, well, uh, everybody's heard the term cyber bullets or cyber bombs, and, and we all kind of laugh in the industry because it's not the same thing. The concept does not fold right. properly. So the evolution and understanding of what a, a, a cyber tool is or a cyber weapon is is actually something that you can kind of see evolving in real time right now, which I think is really fascinating because it's history happening right now. Well, what's interesting to me, so my, I'm of a generation that grew up with nuclear weapons as the transformative technology. And there's such an interesting parallel between the early years of nuclear power and now we're kind of in the early years of cyber in that the bosses, the policymakers, the generals, the high ups, have no idea what the hell they're talking right. about, what's going on. And so this young gun group came in, Rand and some of these think tanks in the 1940s and 50s, some of the physicists who had worked on the Manhattan Project who were in their 20s, and they were the experts. They actually started creating policy and right. developing policy. You're seeing the same thing today, yeah. where, I mean, Barack Obama, you know, for being the young, hip president, didn't have a clue. Yeah. And let's not get into other presidents and other policymakers <laughs> about their knowledge on what's going on in the world, but if you look at... I don't know who you're talking about. But even, even generals in the military, there are some that are very tuned in, like Mike Rogers, who just mm -hmm. retired as NSA chief in Cyber Command, yep. but very few. How difficult is that? Because dissemination of intelligence is always hard. Right, talking to policymakers about what intelligence means right. and why they should pay attention to it, even if you're talking about how good a tank is or how a person's going to act a certain way. But now you're talking about the cyber right. and the magical world. Was that something that was constantly on your mind about, okay, we can do intelligence really well, oh, yeah. but how the hell are we going get, to get these people to understand what we're doing? Yes. Well, I, I was just a cog in the wheel, of course. Uh, so my opinions don't matter. In this room, they do. So fantastic on, <laughs> on me for being here. And thank you for inviting me. Um, but the, the abstract concept of what cyber is, 
um, you know, the way that we were just alluding to it, it's, it's abstract. It's not, it's not, uh, it isn't a bomb. It's not, you don't wield the same type of power with a nuclear weapon that you do with, uh, with information. It, it operates in a very different paradigm. So when you understand how that, how that function works and what you can do with it, then you can actually start to adapt it to something that's more weaponizable. Um, some countries do that better than others. Uh, some some commanders do that better than others, but it's it's all a ma it's all a matter of understanding where that fits in the in the modern arsenal. That we are not quite there yet, I don't right. think, in the United States. Um, but that is part of the evolution, as you asked a moment ago. Where are we at? We're there. We're trying to figure out how we use this. Well, 2016 was an extraordinary moment, as you mentioned, because the beginning of that operation wasn't that different: breaking into a system and stealing information. Right? I mean, that's what Creep did in 1972 right. at Watergate, right? They yep. just did it in a very different Low way. Tech. That's what we've been doing since the beginning of time. That right. is intelligence collection, yes. is stealing information that somebody doesn't want you to have. Yep. I think what the difference was, was they weaponized the information. Yes. And that's really one of the first times we've seen that, where information was stolen and then used against us. In the community, was that a, a watershed moment? I mean, it was that a kind of point where everyone said the games the rules of the game have changed. It's certainly become uh, more of a discussion point on the outside of government. That's where I've been having most of these discussions. Uh, because when I when I was with the government, that there wasn't much research being done. I mean, I'm sure there was research being done. I was not a part of it. But um, the the discussion on the outside has certainly been um, how since 2016. What do we do now? How do how do we, as the public, process this information? And is there anything that private industry can do or has to do? And what's the role of government in all of this? It's it's taken a long time to try and figure that out, and we are just not even. I feel like we're not right. even close. Well, I mean, it almost seems like a losing battle where people who are information security. I've heard a lot of people talk about. Well, you're never going to keep everybody out. Right. So it's about mitigating damage. Right. right? It's about creating fake folders and fake files. And that almost seems like we've given up the battle before, I mean, the war before it even started. The yeah. idea of like, how can we prevent getting cleaned out completely right. instead of keeping people out? Uh, and so it, it very quickly went from, you know, like McAfee vi antivirus and keep the bad guys out right. to how do we make it to where they don't make our company go broke right. overnight? Yeah. Well, it's a, different, it's a different interplay between the way that private industry does things and the way that the government does things. I mean, certainly a lot of the same security concepts apply. You know, we talk like defense in depth is one of these concepts that's like way too deep to get into right now. Um, but it is, a, it is a concept that applies on the defense of information. Um, but how it, how it gets used when it leaves your control is certainly something that is, uh, it's, it's a difficult point to contend with. And we, you know, see that all all the time with every big breach that occurs. Um, how does how can a government or how can a company do anything with that? The Capital One breach is a, is a great one that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, what happens when 16 million customers lose their information? What happens when that leaves the control of a company? I guess we'll we'll watch your background check for you for a little while and get you some some protection. But like that lasts a year, and that information has a, a permanent value to it. So there's there's very limited amount that a company even can do these days. Well, there's a limited amount that a government can do. Let's talk about government versus state versus state cyber sure. attacks because we're at a point, again, going back to the nuclear policy angle, is what kept World War III from happening, according to a lot of people, was this concept of the deterrence, right? right? Strategic deterrence. We've got nukes, you've got nukes. We don't, the whole world will end if anyone starts a war. Right. Deterrence in the cyber realm is far more difficult. In many respects, it's because how the hell do we know where it's coming from? Right. right? How do we deter an adversary if the adversary can hit us and we can't actually attribute that attack to someone? Yeah. I mean, look at, you know, Stuxnet's a great example of this. I don't know, you, you were in the, in the business, so you can always talk so much about Stuxnet in one way or the other, but the, everyone kind of understands that if it had been done right, no one would have ever heard that word before. And it was only because it was a mistake that it became public. And there's no way that it would have been attributable to anyone except for the screw-up. And you can imagine how much of that is happening, to where we, got, we get hit something big, uh, the government loses a lot of information, we have no idea who did it. How hard is it today to do attribution, to actually know who came after you? 
attribution is, uh, it's, a, an, it's a combination of an art and a science, and there are about as many opinions as there are people who practice it. Um, there, there seems to be a, a mistaken notion that we can just find whoever did whatever and we can make them pay. And it, it just really doesn't work like that in the real world. Um, there's too much complexity to, uh, to really be able to say with a, a high degree of certainty who did what. Now, some, there are some techniques, I'm sure, that governments have that, can, that they can get a, a better beat on this. Um, but not everybody has that, that kind of capability. Um, one example that, that just recently happened was the, uh, the Israeli bombing of a, a Hamas um, uh, uh, hacker group that occurred. Um, and that was interesting because they were so sure that they were operating out of a specific location, they dropped a bomb on the building. Um, and it didn't surprise a whole lot of people who work in, uh, in cyber because we all kind of see ourselves as being potential targets in this space. Um, we are, we're an extension of war fighters. Mm -hmm. When you work for the government, that's, you have to assume that you're a part of that target set. So um, the, the attribution angle is something that, that we, we, if you want to do anything reciprocal, you have to get right. And not everybody has the guts to, uh, to take direct action on that issue. Right, I mean, you, you talked about that case as a, basically a kinetic response, right? Kind of the fancy way of saying, take it out of the cyber world and actually kill somebody. Right. Even with something like digital forensics, which is kind of the big buzzword where you look at like a wanna cry and you can take individual lines of code and match it up with the same lines of code and go, right. These, this is the same person yes. who wrote this. Even if we track something back to Moscow, mm -hmm. a block away from the Kremlin, Putin can be like, I don't know who this is. Right. This could just be a patriotic Russian who is attacking, you can't say it was, it was the Russian government, you right. can't put it on them. So yeah, we're not gonna drop a bomb down the chimney of the Kremlin right. because there's absolutely no way to prove that. Right. And we outsource, and this is, again, you may not be able to confirm or deny this because of the government, we outsource some of our operations as well to where there is this old school idea of plausible deniability. Uh, the idea is, you know, it's clear if it's coming from Fort Meade that the NSA is behind something. But we're not dumb enough to do it that way, and the Russians aren't, and the Chinese aren't, and everybody else around the world is too. So when you talk about attribution, how do you counterattack? How do you hack back? How do you actually do something that will deter people from ha happening again? Because you hear that buzzword, right? That's right. the thing, and everyone gets on the president, and, and God knows I do too, but the, the whole idea of you got to send the Russians a message that if they do this in right. 2020, well, how? Yeah. Right? How do you make it? to where they're too afraid to do it again. Right. Because it worked pretty damn well the first time. Yeah, there's, there's so much, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not operating at that level necessarily, but there, there's so much geopolitics that goes into the responsive uh, messaging in, in that kind of situation. And in the past, it seems like the messaging has been the only way that you really can respond to it. Um, there, there, uh, you know, we have uh, military doctrine that, that says that we could potentially respond kinetically to something like this, but when do you test that? Right. Um, when, when do you actually decide that it's time to actually uh, let a bomb off the, tra uh, you know, trigger a, a, a bomb against somebody? Um, it's not, it's not uh, the easiest decision to make when the attribution for stuff like this is, is uh, fuzzy sometimes. And even when you have certainty, there's still, the geopolitics comes back right. into it. Do you really, are, is it really worth having uh, responding to something kinetically where then you've just opened the door to a responsive kinetic attack and where is that going to occur? Right. There's just so many angles. It's it's hard to even have the find the desire to open that door. Well, you mentioned, I mean, and I think a lot of people may not know this, is that it is stated DOD policy and national policy that if there's a cyber attack on critical infrastructure, right. we will treat that as a kinetic attack. Right. And in some cases, if it's hardcore, yeah. we will treat that as a potential for a full, big time retaliatory response. Right. And there are people that even talked about nuclear response in right. some cases if it's a big, that's, that's stated DOD policy. Right. Opening that can of worms, like it's one of these things where if you look back again at the Cold War mm -hmm. and the idea of, you know, if we hit them with three or four nukes, the only way they can respond is to send everything they have and then everybody dies. Right. Who is willing to do that? But you have to, at least for deterrence to work, you have to have a credible threat. Right. It, that, that to me is now we're in the psychological realm right. of things we didn't really want to be yeah. after the Cold War ended. Right. 
yeah, you, you don't you don't want to be in the position of having to respond to something like that, with especially with, yeah. God forbid, nuclear weapons. Um, but the critical the critical infrastructure is a really good point because there's so much to that. Like, where does it start and where does it end? There there's obviously a stated critical infrastructure that the United States cares about. Um, I personally would say that the civilization depends on the, my top three things. Uh, civilization depends on clean water, electricity, and candy. And if you bomb my candy factory, <laughs> it's really going to—we're going to have issues. That's not necessarily the paradigm of needs, and the, <laughs> but that's fine. You know what? You can have your own. Perfectly fine. Let me let me ask you what what I want. You mentioned this idea of kind of private industry, and we talked about the government. I want to talk about this relationship between the two. And you've been asked a thousand questions, I'm sure, before about the public-private partnership. But I want to ask you in a different. I want to talk about the community itself. The community of people who do what you do. Because the movies have it, like, all hackers know everybody else. You know, it's all one, they, you know, everyone has everyone else's number. Right. And I, I kind of joked about that, and then we've had conversations. We're like, oh, I know that guy. Yeah. I know them. I know them. I'm like, oh, the movies are real. <laughs> um, I mean, so this is kind of true also. But I, what I wonder about is, has the community gotten bad, almost like the gaming community has, where yeah. the incels have come, and, like, there's been kind of this pushback because there, there had been a mentality of people who did hacktivism, people who were in this community, yeah. were all about egalitarianism. Right. Where actually, you know, I was going to ask you about the idea of you're a very outspoken advocate of LGBTQ, mm -hmm. um, uh, the community, and how that jolled with you being in the army, working for the army and for yeah. CIA and other things like that. But I wonder if the community is kind of starting to go on that path that the gaming community and some of the, because there's a lot of crossover yeah. in the two of kind of starting to push back against being as open and as, let's use the word liberal. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I would say that in general, my experience with people has been overwhelmingly positive and, and outstanding, uh, outstandingly positive. I was actually just talking with um, a colleague in the InfoSec industry, shout out to Dave Kennedy. Um, so we were, we were talking about the, uh, the kind of evolution of the community and the way that people interact socially. And it, the weirdest thing to me is that, um, We've been doing a lot of the things that, that people are doing now for a, a long time. Uh, memes, before they became a popular thing, was something that we did in the InfoSec community probably 15, you know, 15 20 years ago. We've been doing inside jokes like that and trading them on the internet for uh, as long as I've been doing it. Um, but it, at a certain point, uh, this exploded into the mainstream. All of the things that we used to joke among ourselves pre-2016 suddenly became everybody else's humor and everybody else's way of communicating. And it's really, uh, in some ways, it's unsettling to see the, the kind of the good, bad, and the ugly all become everybody's, a part of everybody's experience. And um, it, it's, it's bizarre for me personally. I don't know if anyone else experiences the same uh, reaction to that as I do in the community. But it, it, it also kind of overlaps the idea that in the last, since 9-11 at least, that about how intelligence has become yeah. so well understood or at least known by the general public right. because every front page of every newspaper since 9-11 has had some kind of an intelligence story on right. it, whether it's about drones or Snowden or something yeah. else. And cyber has been a big part of that too where even before 2016, all of a sudden it's mainstream. All of a sudden people think they know a little bit about it or you know, someone like you who could probably gone through their entire life anonymously is kind of thrust Sometimes into the limelight. Wish. Right, Sometimes well, that's wish. the thing is, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden, everyone from Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning, I'm not just talking about them, but the, the people on the other side too, um, who probably 15 years ago, no one would have ever known their names, yeah. are now thrust into this prominent position because people understand, or at least they, they it's much more mainstream than it was before. Right, yeah, it is, it's definitely a weird adaptation that we've had to make, certainly socially. Uh, I know within the InfoSec community, we, we're, there's, there is a certain undercurrent of fame even among InfoSec people, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird that there's so much recognition even among people who aren't in the, in the community. Let me, let me ask you, one thing you decided to do um, is kind of take it upon yourself to do something what I thought was fantastically good for the community. And this is kind of how we met almost in the beginning mm -hmm. is you kind of reached out and said, hey, I'm doing this thing. I think it's really kind of cool. The Spy Museum might be interested in it. And it was right on the heels of the Googles of the world and others saying, we can't control, and they still are saying this, we can't control and police 
what is being put on Facebook and Twitter, right. because there's no way that anyone can build an algorithm or any kind of system that will automatically find like white supremacist memes or neo-Nazi or anything else. We don't have enough people right. to go through and find all the tweets and find all the Facebook posts. And years ago, you said that's bullshit. Yeah. That I don't have enough people to do it either, but I can train a computer to do it for me. Yeah. And that's where Nemesis came from. Can right. you please talk about this? Yeah. This so, to me, this this is I, I you you sent this to me and I'm like, holy Jesus, yeah. this, this is one person doing this. Right. Now it's, you've branched out, but yeah. Well, it, the, it's funny that you bring it up in that context because uh, the technology that I use is actually Google Tech. So it, it's it's not necessarily <laughs> that they that they can't or don't have the technology to do it. It's a bit more complex than that. A part of it is the will, that they, didn't, they don't necessarily have the will to police it. Um, but it, it does take a lot of care and feeding. Anyway, Nemesis is this thing that I developed uh, back in 2017, uh, just after Charlottesville. Um, there, there was a, we, we called them, we used to call them crypto fascists. You don't have that term as much as you did in 2017 because unfortunately, they don't need to be crypto anymore, which has kind of made my whole tool obsolete at this point. Um, but but uh, I took this technology called TensorFlow and I adapted it to be able to look for uh, patterns and imagery that are associated with um, white nationalist symbolism. So if there's a swastika in the picture, my technology can find it. You just provide the picture and it will, it will put a little colorful box around it and tell you what it is. Um, it was great technology at the time to play with because those uh, symbols aren't always uh, known by everybody. So you could put any given picture into it, and if you didn't know what symbol it was, it would tell you. Um, now there's not so much of a need to use uh, hidden uh, encrypt, so, encrypted, so to speak, language. Um, you can just kind of say whatever you want to, <laughs> and there's no real right. uh, consequence for it, which is more unfortunate even than I feel like 2017 right. had. Well, I mean, this was, yeah, I mean, it, swastika, it went beyond that, you know, things right. that were, were a little bit, may were obscure, right. that were inside of other symbols or things that you look at and be like, oh, what's the big deal about that? Right. It's like, well, the big deal is that this was used by the Nazis and right. all the things like that, too. Uh, I mean, that, that, to me, you did it by yourself. Yeah. Whereas these entire these massive companies were saying it was impossible to do, right. um, did they see what you were doing and any kind of pushback or acceptance? Or yeah. I, I know certainly within the community, people loved what you were doing. You right. got a lot of really great kudos from the community. What about those companies? What about the the people who you're kind of saying? Stop lying to everybody. Yeah. You could easily do this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I did have two great devs that were helping me out um, on the technology side. Uh, on the company side, the, I, I think I might have, may have had one person reach out to me uh, representing social media. My my understanding was that they did have, they had been working on projects of their own. I'm certain that they have something now. I don't know what it is, but um, the, there is room for them to be uh, doing more of this. Um, I think they're doing an okay job now, but we only know what, they, we only know how the extent of the technology that they employ and how well they're doing until something happens in their platform, unfortunately. And, uh, and just recently, there's been even more controversy about other forums that are even less policed than the big ones that we know about, um, constantly facing down criticism and having to jump from um, uh, internet service provider to uh, content data network provider just to avoid having... Uh, having their service get pulled, so right. it's it's a, it's an ongoing battle for these people, and I, I really hope that they have to that they're put against the ropes as long as we can continue that. Well, that's the thing. I mean, is it an advantage that they? You talked about how bad it is, and I agree with you that they've become so much more bold, and you know, not having to hide anymore about being so overtly racist. Yeah. That kind of puts a target on them a little bit more, though, too. Yes. I mean, it, it makes it easier yeah. in many respects to say, "All right, you want to come out and be like at your clan rally? Yeah. Great. You just painted a target on your back." Yeah. I mean, is is there a kind of a double-edged sword for them in that respect? I think there is. I don't have the comfort that some people have in saying, um, "Well, I, I'm glad that that Charlottesville happened because I, now everybody's out in in public and they have to admit to this." I don't have that kind of that kind of like. Uh, casual relationship with saying that. I, I would prefer for people to be able to, to, not be able to, but I would prefer for people to own their beliefs and to have to be held accountable for them. 
um, socially, these people have drawn a, maybe more attention than they intended to to themselves, but it's only because they've been empowered to by people in leadership. So uh, it's, it's now incumbent upon all of us. We, we are all nemesis now. We, we all own this responsibility, this chunk of responsibility to say, this isn't acceptable and we are going to push back on this. So it's, I'm glad that it's taken out of the hands of technology and put into the hands of people that can actually do something about it. Well, let's talk about hands of technology. Because what we kind of were doing a little bit was a really kind of embryonic form of artificial intelligence. And, and that word gets thrown around, that phrase. Oh, God. And you everyone, said it. You either, said it either people think <laughs> Skynet and the Terminator, or they think of the fact that when I post a picture of my cat, <laughs> Facebook tags it as my dog, mm. or it tags it as my sister. The classic cat yeah, dog right? problem. It's like, yeah. oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kim, my sister, but Elwood the cat was tagged by Facebook <laughs> because it's too goddamn dumb yeah. to know that it's not a cat. So, you know, there, there's that literally in the same day you go from Facebook AI looking ridiculous to concepts of Skynet. Yeah. Obviously, we're somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, is artificial intelligence the big next thing? Or is it stuff like implantable technology or you know, what people talk about, like human-machine hybrid? And again, that sounds like cyborg kind of thing like yeah. that, but we're almost there. We're, we're practically there already yeah. in many respects. There's, there are so many fronts of what the next big thing is. Uh, artificial intelligence is, is one of those things that's really creeping up on us, and it's happening more and more in ways that we don't really fully see all the time. Um, facial recognition is, is one of those kind of like uh, points where, where we start to see the technology really being used more and more frequently and relied on more and more frequently. Uh, every time I see a facial recognition technology being used to uh, verify somebody's identity, I kind of cringe because I've seen how the technology is used and how, what, where it fails. And I just don't, I don't personally think it's ready. Um, but we, we do have to watch those things and understand how they work because they're going to be a part of our lives very soon. Um, implantable technology is another one of those things where we have, if, if you are under any delusion that we don't have cyborgs right now, we do. Um, there, there is technology being implanted in people's bodies all the time and in growing uh, numbers. And it's, it's changing all kinds of things. Um, we, it may take more time before we see it happening on a social level, but it's, it's certainly technology that is going to be shaping the way that um, it, to, come, to bring the discussion full circle, it's certainly technology that's going to be shaping the future of intelligence collection and, and intelligence um, management. All of those pieces are going to be uh, impacted deeply by both of those technologies. Well, I mean, look at covert action. I mean, there's the story of Dick Cheney. I mean, the, the networked pacemaker. Yes. Where, uh, if you know this story or not, Dick Cheney had a very, very modern pacemaker put in that had the capability of a network connection so that the doctor could actually basically look at how the pacemaker was doing yep. over the time. And Cheney, rightly so, said, you got to turn that off, yeah. right? Because what if my pacemaker is hacked? Yeah. I mean, talk about the greatest covert action in history. That would have been Because no one would have blinked twice if Cheney collapsed from a heart attack. Right. I mean, Cheney is more machine than man now anyway, right? It would have been like, <laughs> oh, Dick Cheney died of a heart attack. But it could have been a covert action. I mean, you look sure. at that now where insulin pumps more than ever before are now being networked to where there can be a, a machine with intelligence mm -hmm. that can track your blood sugar levels and tweak your insulin. Imagine hacking that and just dumping you know, uh, insulin into the body. You could kill somebody that way. And that's just stuff I can think of, yeah. right? I'm not devious enough to yeah. really come up with the bad stuff. Yeah. But groups like IARPA and DARPA and others are doing these when it comes to getting soldiers mm -hmm. more capable of battle. And that's not just about machines also, that's about drugs and other things yep. that make it to where you don't need to eat for four days, right. you don't need to sleep for a week and yep. other things like that too. That's gonna have huge implications yeah. on the way intelligence is done. Yeah, I mean, we've been on that path since World War II, yeah. just uh, modifying your body function through drugs and, and other means. Uh, the, the whole, uh, Healthcare information security is a very interesting topic because it's another one of those those features that doesn't get talked a whole lot about. There's a tool that there's a thing that I like to spend time doing just for fun from time to time. There's a thing that we have called Shodan, um, and Shodan is a tool that 
it uh, scans the internet for different devices and it kind of looks for vulnerabilities. And every once in a while, you'll get a device where there's an open interface. And so you can actually, it will take a screenshot of a desktop um, environment that's just open. You could connect to it if you want to, and you could interact with it if you wanted to. Um, not legally, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, there's all kinds of interesting uh, devices that show up on that. I, I used to find um, uh, pharmaceutical machines from time to time where it would have, because of the way that it would take a screenshot, uh, it would have been open on somebody's um, prescription information with first name, last name, address, phone number, uh, what they came in to, to order that day, all of that information just displayed on this one screenshot that was taken by a tool. Um, and, and that's, they've since been doing a better job of that, but right. it's, anybody can see these things. Well, that's, ex you can think of the, God, the, again, this is where my brain goes in 50 different directions. Some people might, oh, you can mess with their prescription. I'm not thinking that way. I'm thinking, I could recruit the hell out of that person. Oh, for sure. Because if I know they're manic, I know they're bipolar, yep. or if I know that they are depressed or they're taking a certain drug, that that I own, like that that can be a, a real problem for them if they're right. on a certain job or a thing like that. So just privacy and information security has so many parameters that we're not thinking of. Right. Um, and you know, it used to be, you know, being gay was the reason you weren't going to get security clearance. Then it was now more financial stuff, right? If you owe people money. But because so much information or so much of our lives is now attainable by bad people, it becomes the broad counterintelligence perspective of how do we make sure this person is not compromised right. becomes huge. Right. And it never really was that big before. Yeah. Yeah, there's there are so many new angles that we have to discover and we have to we have to crash before we can really figure out how to fix it. So um, in, including in, in healthcare, which is really scary to have to say, but the, the laws between, behind uh, health and information privacy need to catch up in some respects. Um, there, there needs to be better auditing behind that thing. Even, even uh, or industrial control systems, you can find on the same thing I was telling you about before on Showdown. So every, every aspect of our lives that has a computer attached to it in some abstract, even abstract way, uh, needs to be assessed for how it can impact our, our everyday lives. You used the word assessed, and this is the last question I'm going to ask, then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Who does the assessing? Oh, I do. Well, I know you do, but like, <laughs> is the United States government creating, a, a, I mean, Cyber Command, NSA, they're doing, yes, they're doing information security stuff, there are defensive people, mm -hmm. but that's the primary focus is not to make sure that your medical records get protected. You know, that, that's, that's being done right. on the private side, that's being done by CrowdStrike or right. iDefense or whomever. But who does it in a big picture sense, right? Shouldn't there be an agency, an organization, a, a conglomerate yes. that's doing this because the power of individuals, even big companies, right? If you look at Kaspersky or others, these massive conglomerates, they, they, they can't keep up. Yeah. There's just too much work. Yeah. Um, the, the NSA apparently is, is working on creating a, a, diverse, a, a division to specifically provide those types of services for the government. They've done this for years, but the, a more dedicated group uh, of, apparently is being created for that purpose. Um, it, it, there's so much work to do that it has to be a public-private partnership where the, the public uh, service side of it is handled by, you know, fantastic people that do a great job, like the National Security Agency um, and Department of Homeland Security. Uh, as far as how that impacts all of us, there, there are private industry organizations that do the same thing. You might be fascinated to know, actually, the, the industry is growing in, in ways that are really interesting to me. Um, you, if you were a company that wanted to assess the vulnerability of your building, you can hire people that will break into your building for you. Um, you can hire people that will find a way to uh, to open a window or break a window or um, so we call it social engineering their way into your building, whether it's uh, taking a picture of a, a badge, which by the way, don't ever take a picture of what gets you into work and post it anywhere because that will be used to get into your building. Well, yeah, I mean, that's why they tell everyone to there, put your badge away on the metro and all that. Stuff. There, there is a cottage industry of people who go on Instagram just looking for badge pictures that they can, if they're in that line of work, they'll take a picture of it, they'll take that picture that you used, crop it, print it, in such a way that will get them into, into your building. 
Um, but that's, it's a growing industry with a lot of really interesting people who are all in Las Vegas right now yeah. while I'm here. Um, and it's, uh, it's endlessly interesting, especially if you're new to it. But that's, that's, that's not new in the broader sense. There have been people doing red teaming oh, sure. for a long time. I mean, I met military has been doing op four operations yeah. for decades. Yep. Or the National Training Center in the Mojave Desert, you know, in the middle of California, poor, poor army units and others get sent out there, they get their ass kicked yeah. by the op four. And that's you know, the way to learn what your vulnerability, what you're bad at, what you're right. good at, and all these other things. It's nice to see that kind of getting into this domain now yeah. where the best way to learn is kind of practice. Yeah. In this case, you, you learn your vulnerabilities by having them exposed. Right. Uh, and so you'd rather them be exposed by a company that you're paying versus Iran right? You know, or China or someone like that. Yeah, there, there's still a lot of heartburn around that. I mean, people are very sensitive about discussion, discussing how they will do that against their own sites because it, it, is, it can be embarrassing and it can make people a little bit worried to hear, oh, you hired a professional burglar to break into your building? What does that mean for me? Um, so those, those questions have to be, I think uh, on, all, on all of our parts, we have to understand how security applies to our own personal information so that we don't have that kind of like, we call it FUD, fear and un uncertainty and doubt about uh, everything that occurs because it's not, it's not all scary. It's not all spooky. It's, it's a part of what we have to do to protect ourselves. Um, and it doesn't have to be scary. It, it, it's a, a fairly normal part of life in most cases these days. Well, and I think that's what people probably will eventually need to realize. It's like, it's like you lock your door. Right. You don't think about why you lock your door. Right. You just lock your door. It's not that, you know, if you go through the process of being, so I don't have an ax murderer come in right. and chop me up at night, you just know at the end of the day, you lock your door. Right. Well, we need to have that same kind of security when we're thinking about computers and, and our phones and everything else. And, you know, we put a seatbelt on it. Right. We're not, we don't expect to get in a car accident. Right. We probably never will. But we do, we do increasingly expect that, that companies will do that for us. Yes. Um, so whenever a breach occurs, we all get kind of angry and like, oh, well, I can't believe that somebody, that this company that I trusted would, would lose all of my personal information. But the reality is that we, we entrust that to them. Uh, and, and everything that goes along with it. We expect them to do the things right. that we don't understand. Hire that burglar to break into your building because I don't know anything about that. And so there- yeah, Target, you sell me so $4 many. socks. Here's all my information. <laughs> you protect it. It's but some of it we give away freely too. Right. And that's another, that's another that's issue a whole entirely. Other, that's, a, that's an entire <laughs> another hour conversation. So let me open up to anyone who has a question from the audience. There is a microphone there. So if you do, just come on down and ask a question into the microphone so we can pick it up and so we can hear it. Hi. Good evening, thank you for coming out and talking to us about this topic. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that one of our biggest vulnerabilities isn't at the federal government because there's a lot of resources that are going into that with NSA and Cybercom and such, but we see some cases, for example, ransomware that have hit, I believe, Atlanta and Baltimore and things like that, and that's you know. Then you look at some of the infrastructure you're talking about, um, power plants and utility distribution systems, communication systems, and those are all decentralized out there. Obviously, things like how NSA is doing business and CyberO and CyberD is very highly classified, but there it seems like the information sharing of those technologies where the resources are developing it would be problematical with how do you push that down to levels where you know, the security isn't quite as robust as at perhaps the federal government level. What, what would be your thoughts on that that could do something to mitigate uh, those, th those threat levels that we're seeing at state and municipal levels? So assessments are, are a very good response to that. So uh, you, you brought up Baltimore specifically in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that ongoing process of doing assessments against your own infrastructure is something, like I said, people have to do it. It's, mm -hmm. it's expected by the people of Baltimore and Atlanta mm -hmm. that, that, they, that the people who run these systems understand what they have and what they have, what's available to them, what they mm -hmm. have to engineer, and what has to be protected. Um, there, there needs to be uh, more focus on that, and until there is, we're going to see more high-profile hacks like that. I mean, it's just how important is redundancy, feast. like uh, re offline redundancy? I mean, you look at a lot of the power grid protections are right. being designed 
behind, yeah, you might be able to hack in and do some damage for 10 minutes. Yeah. Because after that, we're just going to reroute it from a right. non-network redundant right. system. So, you know, the whole, the end of the civilization is never going to happen. Yeah. Because we've got something that can't be hacked. Yeah. You know, and that was the whole idea about, like, people joked about our ICBM silos are right. still targeted with these huge, yeah. not even like the three by five floppies. We're like the big ones. Yes. And like, that's so old. Like, yeah, because you can't hack it. Right. Right. Well, the, the interesting thing there is that the, there's a, there are two worlds. There are two big worlds in information security as far as I see it. There's the information technology world and there's the operational technology world. And redundancy is something that you can do uh, with with information, with data. You can you can back up your information. What you can't do is back up like a, conve a conveyor belt system. So you only have one of those. And if you only have one, there's unless you have multiple layers of redundancy to do something like uh, like fill your Coke bottles, for instance. If you don't have multiple uh, conveyor belts to pick up the slack, one conveyor belt going out is going to impact your business. So you, it's a, it's again, it's kind of a different paradigm than mm -hmm. we generally think about. But if that gets compromised by through some cyber means or even in something more innocent like a PLC just stops working, um, that that becomes a big issue, and you can your your ab ability to make money for that amount of time is right. shut down. Right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Sorry, it's kind of high. really <laughs> high. Hi. Do you buy stocks at Target? Do you find, do you do that? I mean, I think my question is. I feel like it's really hard to always get everything you want without going out and you know putting your information out on the internet. So do you guys do that? Or is it like terrifying to you and you don't do it? And if you do, what steps do you take to protect yourself? I think I, I think I might have missed the basic question. Like do you do you shop at Target? Do you oh, do you shop your at Target online you, and put your information oh, yeah, online? On their website? Like how how much because how can you avoid Terms of service for like yeah. just Facebook. It's yeah. basically we can use this any way we want to. Yeah, gosh, I'm a human, uh, so I I do. Yes, I do because um, because it's hard to avoid in the modern world, and I also have two kids, so <laughs> uh, some we have to deal with uh, with all of the things that go along with just living life. Right. Occasionally, you do have to accept the risk. That's what the term that we use in the business. Um, you know that there is a problem. You have to just accept that you're, from time to time, somebody's going to steal your credit card information and you're going to have to get a new credit card. That amount of uh, risk and mitigation is thankfully absorbed by the credit companies these days. So if somebody goes and buys uh, $600 worth of tires in Idaho, because that never happened to me before recently, um, you just get a new card and you move on with your right. life. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't protect yourself. It just means you become aware of what your threats are. That means you don't go on Facebook during your vacation and say, we're on vacation. Yeah, who are we talking about right now? No, I know. So <laughs> there might be a colleague who works here that's doing that right don't now. Don't post your pictures, yeah. Jackie. Don't post your pictures while you're on vacation <laughs> thousands of miles away. Um, anyway, uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, I do work in HR, and I can agree with you guys on the healthcare aspect of it. Now, in the sense that employers can't deny employees being hired for certain jobs or being promoted. However, healthcare insurance companies are using the smoke and cessation test now where they're able to determine if a person has been a smoker and if they are continuing to be a smoker and they can actually increase their rates. So I completely understand where you guys are coming from and unfortunately it is happening. Um, my question is going back to Nemesis and then also with the other example of Skynet. So I guess going to the movies like with like Minority Report with pre-crime. What's the likelihood of something like that ever coming into fruition? Oh gosh, you just opened a whole can of worms. Yeah. I'm gonna try and keep this short. I have a theory that uh, we won't see the type of thing that you see with, with Skynet, um, um, in the way that I define something like Skynet, it's like a, a malicious artificial intelligence that's bent on killing all humans. Uh, I think that we probably see, and I'm t kind of taking the piss here, I think that we probably see sad computers developed before we actually see like intentionally malicious independent intelligence. So um, now Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy version. Sad computer. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think there's some legitimacy to that because you have to have self-aware machines first before you have a machine that's able to like self-aware in the in the science fiction yeah. uh, aspect uh, before you have a machine that can just on its own decide that it's going to kill people. Um, what scares me is that we're, we're using artificial intelligence in ways that are immediately uh, threatening to not just our, our, so, our mostly our social order, 
Um, there are all kinds of AI technologies right now that are being used to do things like predictive policing, which is, I, I don't know why more, we need, to, we need to be more careful about how we use that information because it takes historic data and it makes policing decisions based on uh, what neighborhoods have been bad in the past. And that's just perpetuating all kinds of different um, race issues that we already have that we need to deal with as humans and we are making the machines inherit that. So that, to me, my concern is more how we use artificial intelligence in that capacity rather than um, avoiding flying robots that want to murder us. Well, I mean, wouldn't flying robots that want to murder us be a result of the programmer kind of programming their own kind of personalities and, and into it? Yeah. So you've got some kind of sadistic guy who didn't get a lot of dates growing right. up, who <laughs> spent a lot of time in his mom's basement covered in Cheeto dust that's designing this system, and that personality is being kind of turned into that, yeah. you know. Well, that's, that's, uh, that would be not an independent type of right. intelligence. Uh, so there, there is a distinct difference yeah. between the two. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I know you touched on this briefly, but I was just curious uh, with the example set, for instance, with A-Chan recently, where they were kind of hounded off the internet, to your point. Um, but what I was really fascinated by was the fact that basically the unilaterally Cloudflare cloud rather, was able to make the decision essentially to take them offline. Right. I was just curious what your thoughts are on the precedent that was set. Does there need to be sort of a larger governing organization or kind of what... What will that lead to going forward? So there, I, I, there are a lot of things that I could say about that. Uh, what I will say is that um, there, there is a difference between governmental uh, governments, uh, U.S. government managing information and the way that we manage information and do information and share information. And there's a difference between that and the way that companies uh, reserve the right to host certain content. Um, Facebook does not have the same kind of responsibility to protect what we interpret as First Amendment rights. Like it or not, that they don't have any responsibility to protect that. The U.S. government certainly does. Right. Um, but then you're talking about regulations. And if you're not okay with regulation, then you definitely don't want the government to be in the business of telling Facebook what they can and can't host. So it's, it's a stick, sticky topic right now, but it's definitely one that yeah. requires more analysis. Yeah. All right, last question. Yeah, so Bri uh, Vince briefly mentioned the gaming industry, which kind of goes back to the media presenting the mass shootings. What role does cybersecurity play in preventing mass shootings, such as the ones that happened in Dayton and El Paso this last weekend? I don't know if you, yeah, if you saw that they're saying they're having a hard time opening the phone of the Dayton shooter. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And we're going back to San Bernardino with yeah. the whole FBI versus... Yeah, and you know, the manifesto that was posted right. online for yeah. the El Paso shooter. Yeah, that that again opens so many different different yeah. topics. Um, there there's been a discussion, a very public discussion about the difference between um, uh, the idea of putting backdoors and encryption, for instance, right. and that touches the I, the whole iPhone debate like right. almost directly. Um, where, where we deal with that as individual citizens is to to kind of look at the way that we use encryption and say, um, is this something that we all need? Yes. We need to have some form of encryption so that we can do even basic things that we all take for granted, like password protection. Um, it, back at about 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't common to have um, secured HTTP, for instance. So it was very easy to just intercept HTTP traffic, and passwords were sent in clear text in a lot of cases. We've uh, grown away from that only because encryption is more ubiquitous. So to the extent that FBI should be able to, or, or any governmental organization should be able to backdoor our security for, um, uh, for, the, for the purpose of protecting us, I think is another one of those uh, security versus pri personal privacy issues that we kind of contended with after USA Patriot and then um, the, the FISA Amendments Act later on. It's one of those questions that, that I think we have to find better answers to with every new uh, question that occurs, that comes up. And I'll just end this. We haven't had the debate, right? I mean, when it was FBI versus Apple, it was a court case, it was about two weeks, and then it was over. Yep. Because FBI lost, and then they just had... They found, they found, they found way. a way in. But they tried to do it legally, but this sounds like this is something we should be debating over a year. Like, where are we coming down on privacy versus security? 
where we are, is it court orders? Is it something where after the fact you right. can go in? I mean, what if there's a clear and present danger? Yes. What if you think there are accomplices out there? Yeah. What we now know that people being arrested around the country who looked at the shooting in El Paso and were inspired by it. Yeah. What if we want to get inside their phones to stop them from doing it? Where is that line? And that, this is not a new debate, right? right? This is not just because of cyber. Yeah. This goes back to kind of the beginning of time yeah. or the idea of listening into conversations yeah. and all this other stuff. We just never had the conversation. It was, it was two weeks. Right. There's a really interesting court case going yeah. on between Jim Comey and Apple, and then it was over. Yeah. And then we stopped talking about yep. it. And that, that to me is problematic. Yeah, we're, we're, just, we're just waiting for that thing to come back up. It's gonna come up again. Yep. S some, sometime sooner or later, we're gonna have to deal with that again. And yep. it's, it's, a, a, it's a right now problem. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us here thank at the podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you all for being here as well. <laughs>